right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I am delighted to be joined by Steve Rosen, who is up in Toronto, Canada. How are you doing, Steve? Yeah, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I feel like we have San Diego weather going on right here in Toronto. So, you know, for the three months of summer, I'm excited. Oh, well, I'm just checking. I'm going to check outside. I think it's a bit cloudy today. I want well, my weather back. It is your, it is your, <laughs> it looks like it's going to rain, but we haven't had rain in like weeks. My grass looks uh, like California style grass. Oh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, absolutely. And our water bills. Um, so uh, Steve is Steve Rosen, sales leadership coaching. Steve is an author, top, uh, top sales world, top 50 sales thought leaders. And Steve helps salespeople and sales leaders. Uh, and this is what we're going to talk about today is uh, actually, Steve, show up your book. Steve has an excellent um, book. Just flash it up there for people. You're, you're too kind. It's a simple yeah, book on some some great tips that I've learned over my 25, or 25 to 30 years of uh, of being a sales leader. And uh, hopefully I can share them in a, in a way that honors sales leaders because it's quick and sharp to the point. Yeah. And so, okay, so what we're going to talk about today is how to lead and succeed in times of change. And let's face it, Steve, times of change, of change is like all the time these days. <laughs> well, <laughs> Not that it wasn't always, but it just seems like change is always upon us. It's rapid. It's sometimes coming out of left field. We've had to deal with a lot of things, obviously, over the last few years. So how do you kind of, how do you kind of first of all, take a step back and assess you know, the, the the situation you're in and the magnitude of the change you may be facing. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned change. About 25 years ago, I took a course on change when I was in industry. And if I sort of remember what, what they said is change is happening at a much quicker pace. So not to reiterate the change, we've all been through it regardless of where we are, but sales leaders have, uh, have suffered through tremendous change in the last two years. And, uh, you know, we can go through the list of things that consumers deal with, like supply chain issues. We can't get the cereal we like on the shelf. The price of that cereal has gone up, I don't know, 30, 40 percent. Uh, and then, of course, we all live on Zoom. Sales leaders are spending more time on Zoom than they're spending uh, in the field with their people. So how do we assess where we are? Um, you know, I actually I mean, it's a great question. I didn't even talk to you about this, but uh uh, we have a nine point assessment that we put together along our sales leadership framework uh, that looks at nine key points and three key pillars, which is leadership, culture, and focus. And the, our, our belief is in times of change uh, that because of all the stuff that's going on, you need to be very focused because at the end of yep. the day, as a sales leader, you need to be driving results. Mm -hmm. So what drives you? Yeah, I was going to say, just going to say on on that point, Steve, is focus. I, I really, I mean, I'm a huge believer in in focus, but um, I think today we live in this world of just so many distractions. I bet you hear this all the time, where people go, "Oh, Steve, like I'm I'm busier than I've ever been," and you know, the reality is we're more distracted than we've ever been. So I think that whole thing about focus is so so critical. So, so maybe what I can do is I take very simple approach to the world. And I think if simplicity has a tremendous amount of value, because to get simplified, you need to have very deep thinking. And uh, what we do at sales leaders, I mean, sales leaders that I just start working with, before we get into how to be a better leader, which some of them are pretty good at anyways, how to build your culture, we work on focus. And one of the first things we work on is very simply looking at where you spend your time, right? Because we all have the same 24 hours in a day, yet some people are rocking it and some people are struggling saying, Steve, but I'm working harder than I ever worked. Like you just said, you know, 60, 70 hours a week, but not getting the results I desire. So for your audience, John, here are basically two things they can do. Uh, pull out their calendar, that's not one of them. And then, actually before they pull out their calendar, what are the three things they can do to impact results. And I'm talking, this can be done at any level, right? It could be done as a sales leader. It could be done as a uh, sales rep, it could be done as a president of the company. But what are the three activities that have the biggest impact on results? 
results results generating activities, RGAs is what I call them. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, probably, I'm just guessing, it's coaching, it's having meetings to keep their people accountable and focused, and it's meeting with customers potentially. So if those are the three key ones, let's look how much time you spend in the next week or how much time you have scheduled the next week to do those three activities. Yeah. Probably very little, because, right? The, I mean, the reality is people want to do a great job, but they're too busy dealing with, uh, pardon my French, the caca that comes with day-to-day -day work. And then what are the three things that are sucking their time? So quite simply, you know, maybe it's Zoom meetings that you don't need to be involved in, but they invite you because you're head of sales or because you're the sales manager and you have a good impact. Uh, you know, maybe it's some other meetings. Maybe it's looking at reports. And what I basically suggest is you do a switch. You, you basically put out your time sucking activities and add in the three things that are going to generate results for the end of the year. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Yeah. Um, just let me pick up on, let me pick up on the, the, one of the ones you mentioned there is coaching, right? Yes. And, and this is, uh, and, and what I've seen in the past uh, often is sales leaders, you know, obviously, you know, understand the, understand the, the importance of coaching and all of that. However, if you are going to, if you're going to coach your salespeople, you actually have to coach them and you have to do it systematically and obviously regularly because what I've often seen is like a sales leader will go, okay, I'm going to start coaching. Hey, Steve, we're going to do a coaching session, you know, once a week or once a fortnight or whatever, let's put it on the calendar. And what do I do? I keep moving, canceling it because other stuff gets in the way. And eventually, you know, maybe we do one or two, but there's nothing systematic, but eventually you're like, ah he doesn't really care about it or she doesn't really care about it. Therefore, I don't really care about it. Okay. So great point, John. Uh, so there's two things here. Number one is the commitment to results generating activities. So it's not just putting it in your calendar once. Once we work with clients, especially new ones who are just understanding our system, uh, we have them schedule out for the next three months who they're going to see and when. Okay, so it does require coaching is about regular intervals of observation and development. The other thing that doesn't happen, which is not so difficult to do, is coaching without a plan is mm -hmm. what I call flavor of the day coaching. And what flavor of the day coaching is, well, I come out with you, whatever day today is, July 27th, I think. Oh, 28th, time flies when you're having yeah. fun. Uh, so today I say, hey, John, you got to work on your closing skills. And the next time I come out and work with you, say, hey, John, you know, you could do a better job handling objections. So to me, the focus part of coaching, because my whole model is around focus, is picking one or two areas to focus on and building a plan to get there where each time the sales manager interacts with their salespeople, whether it be a, a field visit, whether it be a phone call, they're checking up on their plan to coach, I call it a coaching journey. So maybe Steven or John is working on one thing, maybe he's just working on how to handle objections. And the focus for the next six months is how to handle objections. It's not about uh, product knowledge or other things. It's focused on one particular area. Yeah, and I guess the other part of the other part of uh, coaching is actually knowing how to coach, right? Ah. Because sometimes people, because sometimes people's only experience of coaching sometimes is what they had in high school or something or whatever, or their, their sports teams or something like that. And uh, you know, so and let's face it, that's more telling rather than coaching. It's going to be here, Steve. This is what you need to do. Um, but when it comes to working with adults and maybe working with salespeople is you have to know how to really coach and coaching is not telling. 100% John. So, so the, there, there's, I don't know what the number is. I think it's, there's three key shifts to make to be an effective coach. One is, as I just said, coaching starts with a plan. When you build that plan, the individual has to be committed to working on the areas that they're focusing on. So part of it is, is not saying, Hey, John, you got to work on your closing skills. It's about mm -hmm. asking John, John, is there one or two areas that you'd like to work on? They'll have a positive impact on your performance. What are they and how can we get there? And, and really what I'm describing to you uh, is a shift from telling to asking effective questions, 
with the belief is that the person you're coaching has the answers. As the leader, you don't have to have the answers. We all think we do uh, have the answers. Maybe our answers are better. They're not. It's about asking individuals. So a great coach is good at facilitating um, the person's thinking and getting them to think as opposed to telling them what to do. Because first of all, no one wants to be told what to do. So yeah. it goes in one ear and out the other. Um, yeah. So that, that's and, one of the big mindset shifts. Yeah. And I and I think the, the other part of that, Steve, as well, is... Uh, we can we can because it's human nature right we can get very focused on well here's the things you really need to work on steve that maybe you're not doing so well what we don't often do is say oh steve you're doing this part really well and actually we sh we could even we could even improve us even more be fantastic like so that whole approach of because i always find it it's like performance reviews right when people do those what do they do? They say, Steve, here's the one thing you did well last year, and here's the 52,000 things you need to work on. <laughs> so, so actually, John, along the lines of asking versus telling, mm -hmm. uh, what we do in our coaching, our, our focused coaching methodology is we ask the individual, what are some things you're doing really well? Because right. part of it is, is you're only there with them. If you're a really good manager, maybe you're there with them two times a month. Maybe you're not. Maybe it's one time a month. So we want them self-evaluating. And the easiest people to coach are the ones who are self-aware. Sometimes people aren't yeah. self-aware, so we have to maybe help them a little bit more. But really, it's about asking them what's working really well. And one of my biggest questions, which is very different than most, is if there is one area that you would like to work on. I'm not saying if it's good or bad, right? I haven't. As long as it has a positive impact on your performance, what would that be? So I'm putting the onus on the individual to select the area they want to be coached on and improve right. on. So it, it yeah. forms a commitment. Yeah, that's such so, a different that, that's such a different approach than you know than you know you saying, okay, here's what you're gonna work on and here's yeah, what I'm and, I, I, <laughs> yeah. and, I, and I, I I like that uh I like that a lot, but you mentioned something really critical there about the self-awareness piece, okay? Because me, for me, self-awareness is the threshold uh, that you, once you cross into being self-aware, everything gets better. Um, but that's a hard threshold often, and unfortunately, most of us cross that threshold probably later in life than we would care to. So how how is a sales coach, can you help when there's a lack of self-awareness? Because I always feel like that's the hardest thing to overcome. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, John, you've asked, these are great questions and I'm not just saying that to, to make you feel good, but uh, there are some techniques to do that. And, and in fact, one of them that I use, or maybe just a layout a model, if you think of a triangle, and you think mm -hmm. on one side of the triangle, um, well, you, you've got three people, one who is self-confident, one who is arrogant, and one who's a self-doubter. The confident person knows what they do well and knows what they don't do so well. Self-aware, easy to coach. Then you have the arrogant person who probably does 90% of their job well, but applies that to the 10% they're not doing so well on and says, oh, I do great at everything. And then you've got the self-doubter who looks at the 10% they don't do so well and applies it to everything. Oh my God, I'm so bad, blah, blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. So, so how do we help someone self-evaluate? If they're self-confident, life is good, right? They're, they're the easiest people to coach because, you know, I can probably get better at X, Y, Z. Yeah. Uh, so one of the techniques I use and, you know, uh, I'm happy to share is let's say there's a specific skill or, or, or let's actually outline the skills to be successful as a sales person. So you have the, the rep right out, you know, closing, objection handling, uh, probing, product knowledge, so on and so forth. And then you say, okay, John, you don't mind me picking on you, John, but what is the skill that you are tops on? What's your number one skill? What's your number two skill? So what you're, for, what you're having the individual do is force rank their skills. Mm. So, so at some point they're coming to, you know, to what they yeah. may need help on just by the nature of a force rank. So that's one way to create self-awareness. Uh, let the person, do, you know, write it out and then, oh, I'm great at this. I'm good at that. I'm okay at this. Maybe not so good at that. And through that, it, it helps them at least identify areas relative to each other. That's one of the techniques yes. we use. 
No, that's that that's great, Steve, because I think that's a that's just a critical part. And then then another another area too is uh, as you were saying, like uh, in times of change and in times of flux and all of that is. I, and I think the the pandemic really underlined this is is the communication right is as leaders like communicating regularly and openly and maybe communicating in different ways to different people because people receive information differently. But I just think that whole communication piece is is so critical because maybe your whole team's remote now, maybe they always were, but uh, but I think people are craving a, an additional level of communication because they're not everybody's naturally kind of uneasy about the world we live in today. You know, along those lines, John, uh, one of the things in our in our focus sales leadership framework that we have adjusted uh, to the times that the change we've had is what I call bold leadership. And we know there's inspirational leadership. I don't know. There's a, there, there's many forms of leadership. But one of the biggest issues that sales leaders face in times of change is there's an expectation that they make changes to adapt to the marketplace, except they face two issues. Number one, senior management is risk averse, especially now with the R word. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, as much as you want change, they're actually adverse to to yep. accepting your change. And two, your people are so overwhelmed, they think, oh my God, Stephen, not another change. So, yeah. so one of the communication points of a bold leader is a bold leader understands what needs to be done, but also has the communication skills to get it done, which means selling senior management on an idea to improve. And it means, getting your people to buy in on change. So communication mm. of that is, is very different. And as much as, you know, if we talk about it, it doesn't matter, a sales manager may want to make some changes in their area. A VP of sales may want to make some changes. They forget, because I deal with uh, at least 10 of my clients have come up mm -hmm. saying, Stephen, I have a great idea, but I'm getting, I'm not able to sell it. I, I, and so I, I came up with a formula for bold leaders. Uh, because we need to be bold. We we, we, can, we have to find ways to overcome the resistance and to sell upwards the communication, if you want, I'm happy to share that with you, mm -hmm. is we forget to come prepared with a well laid out plan, right? Mm -hmm. and, and if you don't have a well laid out plan, uh, you know, that covers who, what, where, when, why, how much, uh, your, your chances are you're going to be shut down by senior management. You always need one advocate in the room to help you push your ideas forward. If you haven't got the CFO on board or, or you know, many of the, what I call sales prevention departments, you know, you're familiar with those, mm -hmm. of course, legal uh, compliance. Uh, if you don't have what, you know, if you need at least one person to help you move things through in the boardroom. And you know, when there is a no, I don't accept the no. What I, what I default position is, Let's pilot. Let's do it in a small area. Right. So maybe you don't get the whole idea sold, but you get proof of concept moving forward. Um, one of the other things that I, I think sales leaders forget is, you know, status quo just doesn't cut it anymore, right? So there's a mm -hmm. downside risk of not doing anything. Yeah. And you need to share that with senior management. If we don't do this, well, these are the potential downsides. So, you know, there is risk involved here, the risk of doing nothing. And then, of course, what are the upsides? So those are my I have five points that I work with sales leaders on in terms of selling their ideas, because it's very frustrating as a sales leader, especially one who is successful, who keeps getting shut down on on great ideas. Yeah, no, it's 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 very true. But I love the I, I love what you said there about coming prepared, because let's face it. I mean, often we come up with ideas and we're so excited about our idea. Yeah. That we're saying, you know, let's have a meeting about this. And here's my idea. And you're right. Then somebody says, but what about this? And you're going, um, yeah, well, I haven't figured that piece out yet. But what about this? And before you know it, you just, you know, it disintegrates. Um, so that little bit of kind of stopping for a moment and saying, am I ready to sell this? Do I have enough information? I think that's right. a fantastic point there, Steve. So, you know, I mean, it's I always chuckle because you know, assuming if they're a sales leader, uh, they've had a successful sales career and it's not mm -hmm. like they haven't done this before, but they forget. Maybe yeah. it's the excitement. Maybe it's the pressure of uh, having to, to move and to drive things. But if you have a well laid out plan and I've worked with that with folks to 
okay, let's look at what you want to accomplish. I love, like, I can get the idea. I, I've been around long enough. Oh, fuck, I love this. Uh, I just swear. Uh, I love this <laughs> idea. And I get excited, but okay, how are we going to sell it? So mm -hmm. let's not forget that. And then, yeah. of course, I don't know how much time I have, John, but I get very excited about this. How do we lead the change? Because maybe that's what yeah. I, uh, you know, how do we get our people? Once we've got senior management, which is not always an easy task, but we've sure. shared some, at least some good thoughts. And I'm happy to share if anyone wants to reach out to me, you know, how to sell an idea upwards. Uh, but how do you get your team on board? Uh, and also there's a skill to that, right? The, the, you know, part of it is bringing them in into the plan, right? Mm -hmm. Having them, you know, maybe you, maybe you define the what's, you know, we want to accomplish this. We want to do this. We want to do that. And then involve them in the hows. How are we yeah. going to get there? Uh, again, I always believe selling is having that internal person or a champion to support you uh, with your idea. So in my old days when I was VP of sales, I had a great sales manager. Uh, his name is David. Uh, and I'd always run my ideas by him. And he'd mm -hmm. say, no, we can't do this. I'd say, David, you, you know, you're, you're amazing, which he was. Tell me how I can sell this. Right, right. Right. And then I have David as my advocate or my champion with the rest of the sales management team. Even if it's if you're a group of reps, have one of your reps who's the champion who can yeah. help you uh, do that. Be ready. Yeah. You know, it's also preparation. Be ready to address objections. Uh, and then, of course, very similar to selling upwards. What's the impact for them? What are the upsides? And uh, as my old coach once told me, know the whiffums. What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, no, absolutely, Steve. That's fantastic because, yeah, no, I, I, I agree. It, that's another part that people often forget about is, you know, getting the buy-in and, and selling it to the people and including them. And because let's face it, there's nothing we hate more. And we've all been through it in, in different organizations. What I always call is the initiative du jour. And you go, oh, here's the initiative du jour. Like this is be a couple of months. Yes, We're going to yes, have to yes, listen yes, to this. Yes. But it'll go away eventually, just like all the other ones do. Well, I've had six <laughs> managers in the past, and I've outlived all of them, right? So, yeah, exactly, exactly. So we'll we'll appease Stephen on his idea. Uh, <laughs> but but Stephen's success as a leader is based on the buy-in and execution of the plan. So, yeah. you know, so as much as, hey, we've done a great job selling it because we got approval, mm -hmm. the job's not done yet, folks. And, and that's yeah. why, you know, I really think leaders need to, I don't know, I call it bold leadership, but they need to be bold leaders now, especially in this time of extreme, mm -hmm. I don't know what the right word is, extreme, tremendous, uh, crazy change that we're experiencing. And and, yeah. and no one can tell me because I've been around long enough. At least Commun years. Communal, communal stress, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it is stressful. I mean, mm -hmm. many sales leaders are close to, I don't want to say the word, but being burnt out. Yeah. Uh, yeah. There's a Absolutely. lot on their plate. And Absolutely. we try to make it easy for them. Yeah. Well, it's fantastic, Steve. Uh, I mean, we could go on, but, you know, it's John, you uh, just so much stuff out of me in a short period of time. There you go. <laughs> so all of Steve's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, Steve, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. And and also show them the book again. It's a great book, 52 uh, Tips. And what I like about it is, I mean, you know, you've got 52 tips, you've got 52 weeks in the year. There you go. You got it. Actually, some people ask me, <laughs> why the number 52? What I'd like to share, if I can, John, and yeah, it is, you know, we, we have a framework. And if you go to my website, you can find me at, at starresults.com. And on the homepage, we have our framework, which is focus, leadership, culture, in that order. Uh, but we also have a nine-point assessment that's free. Uh, to, to see where you're at in these days. It's a self-assessment. I, I think uh, we, we've had tremendous uh, number of sales managers who have taken it. Uh, it's simple. Like, again, it's it's not hard to do. But how are you doing in, in the three key areas of focus, leadership, and culture? And then I'm happy. Uh, I offer people if they want 15 minutes, which is, uh, I can share a lot of tips in 15 minutes, but actionable okay. items that they can do to improve in one or two areas of the assessment, or if they're good, how do we help them get to great? Again, it's what they want, but I, I really think uh, I'm very excited about it, as you can tell. Yeah, um, yeah. But, but and I, I think it's I, tremendous. I, I would encourage people to do it. I mean, that's amazing. As you've seen from this interview, you know, Steve is all about practical, actionable items. So it's like, so a 50 minutes with Steve is probably going to give you more than 
days of doing other things. So there uh, you go. Well, thank you, John. That's, <laughs> that's, that's too, too kind of you. Uh, well, listen, Steve, thanks again. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again soon.